webinar on uh, borderless Europe, when do we go back to normal? It's an extremely timely um, and relevant conversation as we enter a new phase of losing the, loosening the confinement measures and restart our economy um, in, in light of the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So my name is Alex Martin. I'm the head of the Globsec uh, Brussels office and I will be the moderator of today's conversation. And I'm joined today by a fantastic lineup of speakers. Alena Kutsko, Globsec Policy Institute Director, Lukas Mandel, Member of European Parliament, EPP family, Michal Szymeczka, Member of European Parliament, Renew Europe, Tom Snells, Deputy Head of Cabinet Commissioner Ilva Johansson for Home Affairs, and Katarina Sorensen, Deputy Director of Think Tank Europa. Before we kick off, I wanted to share a few housekeeping notes with the audience. We are on record. In addition to Zoom, we are live on Facebook and we will be monitoring the feed there also to pick up questions for the panelists. Um, we also have live tweeting under the hashtag Globsic Goes Digital. The project is co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union and forms part of our project called DIFGOF, European Governance Potential for Differentiated Cooperation. We'll start this conversation with a couple of remarks by Alena to present her findings in a recently launched report on Schengen, and then we'll continue with the first round of comments from uh, all panelists. And we are um, asking everyone to feed us with questions via the Q&A uh, platform. So Alena, floor is yours to, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you everybody for joining. I wanted to start with setting up uh, the scene a little bit and putting the things in a broader perspective. Coronavirus has highlighted definitely a lot of things in life that people have taken for granted and free movement is surely one of them. Now with the borders closed, the realization sinks in how much it has given us. And the momentum this appreciation generates should in theory facilitate as quick a reopening as possible. What we're trying to look at with the project, and actually you can download a series of papers from our website, we're looking at the resilience of the Schengen zone in the post-crisis world or rather in a world that is marked by a permanent crisis or by a series of crises. We have now a broad agreement that borders were necessary to control the spread of the virus and that they are of temporary nature. Our concern is whether the nature of the border controls is indeed temporary and whether it is possible to ever return to Schengen as before, what are the alternative scenarios and how to get to or what should we be doing now to get to the best possible scenario, which is the full Schengen? Why this is not as easy as it may sound. The crisis has highlighted how important national borders are in the mind of people. Closure of borders was not always necessarily the most efficient response in all cases. But in minds of people, national borders protect. It wasn't the EU external border that everybody was waiting for to protect them. It was the national border that gave the feeling and the reality of control. But also what's important here is that the free movement zone in Europe already had pre-existing conditions. Coronavirus crisis exacerbates these conditions and that's an additional and rather complicated layer. First concern is of course migration. There is nothing new here. We all know the troubles we had the, the flow of migrants in Europe and then the secondary movements within Europe and what effect it had. Second is of course terrorism, which has not disappeared either. And actually even now in the coronavirus situation, France is citing the abuse of uh, vulnerabilities created by coronavirus crisis by terrorists as an official explanation why they're keeping border checks. Uh, another concern is, of course, nationalism. As I described, the introduction of national borders is a reflex that many countries use, whether consciously or unconsciously. And of course, we're not protected against other waves of the coronavirus crisis or of the return of the crisis or the coming of another pandemic in the form of another crisis. We simply cannot ignore this non-corona uh, factors like migration and terrorism because they have not disappeared and have not solved themselves. What it means for the future of Schengen zone? There are definitely several scenarios. One of them is the total collapse of the Schengen zone, which is rather unlikely exactly because that now probably more than ever people understand the value of the Schengen zone and the free movement. Uh, the second scenario, and we're getting there in the more, uh, in the higher likelihood of what can be happening, 
The second scenario is that Schengen zone is going to be broken up into smaller Schengens, where the countries cluster with like-minded ones. Already before this crisis, we had a discussions that, for example, uh, even Emmanuel Macron was uh, um, making statements that we need to reconsider who is the member of Schengen if, let's say, some countries do not want to participate in the solidarity mechanisms and uh, uh, relocation of the migrants within the Schengen zone. And this tendency might continue in the future. Another scenario is just to keep the status quo and to keep the things as they are. Situation that we have now where countries pretty much introduce border checks without much clarity in justifications or ignoring the Schengen code, for example, on how long the checks can last. And that was what happening, uh, for example, after the 2015 migration crisis where six countries kept the border controls for much longer probably than the Schengen code and it, uh, originally created the possibility for. And so, given the current situation and potential health threats, the status quo and pre-corona uh, that was there with us before the coronavirus crisis will become even more unsustainable. And of course, the ideal version is the uh, full and fully function in Schengen zone. I will stop here now, but I hope that in this discussion, we will also be able to elaborate on ideas how to resolve the current border situation, but also how to uh, create the framework for a more resilient Schengen zone in the future. Thank you, Alena, for framing this uh, conversation. And I will uh, give each of the panelists a chance to respond to what you said. And um, we are looking at the issues that you mentioned uh, that also uh, existed before coronavirus, migration, terrorism, nationalism, um, and other type of crisis, and then the four scenarios that you put forward. So, Lucas, I'm getting to you um, because you are from uh, the, the, the other side of the border, you are representing Austria in the European Parliament. And the erection of border infrastructure overnight between Austria and, and Slovakia came as a stark reminder of the past. And this is one of the most transited borders, at least in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And um, with the, the new measures in place, people were literally cut off. So in your view, how are the unilateral measures taken by the member states um, to restrict travel across Europe uh, reflected in the long-term uh, resilience of Schengen and to what extent uh, these measures will erode the sentiment or the collective sentiment of, of Schengen as a policy of uh, cooperation. Thank you very much, first of all, for the invite and good morning to everybody. Thanks to GLOBSEC for organizing uh, today's uh, meeting and thanks to everybody for the exchange. I also look forward to the discussion then and to the questions. Actually, my hometown Gerasdorf is pretty close to the Slovakian border. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty aware of uh, what you have mentioned uh, already. And uh, my home region, Lower Austria, is actually pretty much affected by uh, the lack of Slovakian workers, especially in the field of the care for the elderly and in the field of agriculture. And that's why uh, I really feel what it means to have Schengen and to have open borders uh, and to have uh, especially open borders for goods and services. And that's the first thing I want to state uh, while agreeing with a lot of things Elena has said uh, today, uh, which I want to go deeper into afterwards, like uh, people expected and maybe still expect more security from the national borders than from the EU borders. So that's something we have to deal with. And we uh, we see uh, here problems we have to solve from a, from a political and parliamentary uh, point of view. Uh, we need Schengen. And uh, it's clear to me, and it has been clear from the very beginning of this crisis, that uh, we have to close the borders for non-essential travel. Uh, for regular, like a regular touristic private travel uh, to protect each other. That, that's nothing about history or about uh, European integration or anything alike. It's to protect each other. Like uh, even uh, the single household has to more or less close its borders in times of the pandemic to protect each other. And at the same time, uh, and I'm lucky that uh, after a few obstacles in the beginning, this worked out well. At the same time, we need these open borders for goods and services, uh, in my view, uh, because that's what uh, makes Europe strong. Uh, open borders for goods and services, uh, the common market. Uh, that's also something that um, will help that Europe will maybe be better off after the pandemic than the United States and other parts of the world. So uh, it's one of the strengths of Europe, but on the long run, 
and this is also a field where I agree with Elena, uh, on the long run, we need the protection of uh, the EU borders. Uh, much better than uh, in the past. We need it today, we need it on an everyday uh, basis, uh, but uh, we will need it on the long run to remain uh, with open borders within uh, the European Union and uh, to remain with Schengen. And that's where we have to uh, invest. Uh, nobody yet knows what kind of uh, new migration movements will be caused by the pandemic, but th there will remain some kind of migration movements in the future. We have to do the best that we can in order to make sure that people don't get uprooted in the first place so that they uh, can dwell uh, where they live. And most of the people want to dwell where they live. They don't want to get uprooted. And uh, uh, as we all know, uh, because of smugglers and of other criminals, uh, they sometimes follow false promises. So these are uh, the migration movements we have to avoid. And even if they anyway happen in uh, this or that case, uh, we have to protect our borders. Uh, that's the uh, most important to keep Schengen alive after the pandemic. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, also a post Dublin agreement will be necessary. Uh, for example, the opportunity to relocate migrants also uh, in safe third countries. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not theoretical from my side. I mean, especially the Western Balkan countries, uh, which have already helped us a lot in many cases uh, regarding uh, migration and migration movements. Uh, but uh, that's, uh, I would say that's not mandatory. Uh, Schengen has to remain in place, whether there will be uh, quickly a post Dublin agreement or not. Uh, but these uh, seem to me uh, the most important factors, the, the external borders and the post Dublin agreement to keep Schengen alive after the pandemic. And uh, uh, maybe I, I, I conclude again with uh, really my opinion, which I want to state here, it's fine that we close borders and we closed them in the beginning of uh, the pandemic uh, for non-essential travel because uh, it, it means to protect each other and it's, it's in no way connected with uh, uh, a lack of European solidarity. It's the opposite, actually. It's, it means European so solidarity to protect each other and to close borders for that, but to remain uh, with open borders for goods and services, in my view. Thank you very much, Luca. So an optimistic way of closing the borders as a, as a show of solidarity for, for the other countries and to protect each other. You did raise the point on, on uh, this, that security is seen more coming from the national borders than Europeans, and that's something that probably Tom will also um, uh, get on. But meanwhile, Michal, um, your view from the Slovak side uh, as a representative in European Parliament, do you agree with what Luca said? Um, your your uh, initial remarks, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much and, and uh, good morning to everyone and thanks again uh, to, to Globseg and the team for, for putting this together and for, for the invitation. Um, of course, I agree very much with, uh, with Lucas um, in, in the sense that, uh, that at some point the border closures, such as, you know, is in, in itself a social distancing measure, is in itself a measure to slow down, um, uh, you know, the traffic and exchange of, of, of people which uh, at one point became, uh, you know, a danger to, to, to our health. So in that sense, it was necessary. Uh, I think the problem rather with the, with the closure of borders at the outset of the crisis was not the fact that it was done, but the fact that it was not particularly well coordinated um, between and among the member states, at least, uh, at least in the early days. Um, but let me go back to, um, you know, to, to the situation and to, to, the, to the sense that we have uh, in, in Central Europe or maybe in Slovakia with the situation, because I alluded to it, that now that uh, borders are closed, we are starting to appreciate, uh, you know, the value of, of, of open Europe. And I don't know to what extent you've, um, um, you, you've caught this news, but there was, a, uh, there, was, there was news report that a couple of days ago at the Polish Czech border, the Polish armed forces guarding the border actually fired warning shots um, uh, at a man who was, um, I think he was a German citizen attempting to cross the border from the Czech Republic to Poland by foot. And I mean, in itself, not, nothing happened and it was probably everything was all right, but just the, you know, the, the sight of, sh um, you know, shots being fired at the border in, uh, in Central Europe, in this part of the world, um, steers some, some, some very bad memories and, and, and old demons. So, so I think this is also the way 
um, that, that this is felt. And in, in my country or in Bratislava specifically, I mean, uh, you know, given the um, uh, given the exchange that is happening or that used to be happening between or at the Austrian Slovak border, given the thousands and thousands of people who uh, either commute to Austria every day or they live in Austria and work in Bratislava. I mean, this is very much, a, you know, uh, a personal issue as well. I mean, my sister is caught in Vienna and cannot return home even to see our parents because she wouldn't she wouldn't be allowed to get back um, because she doesn't have permanent residency. And these are lots and lots of stories like this. So I think you're right, Elena, that people are starting to appreciate uh, what it meant, um, you know, that they could, uh, what, what Schengen meant for them and um, for their sense of freedom. But then um, it's not going to be easy. And that's partly uh, going back to the, uh, to the argument I made before, that the problem was that, the, that we've entered this, uh, this, you know, this crisis in an, an, uh, in an uncoordinated fashion, including the, the, the border shutdowns. And while and it's still rather easy to close borders, uh, and it's incredibly difficult to uh, to re sort of glue Schengen back together and to start uh, restoring you know status quo ex ante in a coordinated fashion. I mean, it hasn't been done as 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 Elena says and as the as the paper rightly puts it, it hasn't been done even since the migration crisis. There still wasn't a fully functioning border, and that was four or five years after the crisis. Uh, so so I, I think the scenario that we're likely to see because of the because of the difficulty uh, of going back to full Schengen, uh, I think will be kind of will be very patchy and will be sort of shifting coalitions of countries which will open borders among themselves. This will be fluid depending on on the health situation as the virus might be coming back and there might be new outbreaks. Um, and uh, of course, I mean it's you know the Commission. This is, this is sort of one of the fundamental problems that the Commission uh, has some authority and some some power to uh, to intervene, but but actually. Uh, not, not in, in reality when it, when it, uh, in a crisis situation, it doesn't really have the authority and the legitimacy to enforce uh, the Schengen Code. And I think this is a perennial problem of Schengen going forward. But I see the scenario uh, of, uh, of sort of a patchy and fragmented Schengen going forward, at least in the next couple of months and, or years even. Thank you, Michal. And this is the perfect segue actually to Tom um, to tell us more from the commission perspective how do we um, how did how did we learn the lesson of the initial uncoordinated um, um, actions, and what is the Commission doing now to make sure that we are not fragmenting um, Schengen and all countries are actually working together to uh, lift the restrictions and to ensure that also our single market um, is functioning and our uh, the freedom of movement uh, is restored. So, Tom, uh, to you now. Thank you, uh, Alex, uh, and good morning, and thanks so much for organizing this uh, very important uh, debate, uh, very interesting views. Uh, also, congratulations on the paper, which is a really excellent, uh, thought-provoking, well-researched paper. So I agree with a lot of things that, uh, that are in the paper, and I agree with most what has been already said by, by the, my esteemed other panelists. Um, I think I think uh, it you know there's a lot of talk about uh, is this the end of Schengen and I would say uh, not at all I think it, this uh, the situation has shown how indispensable uh, Schengen has become gradually because this has been a very gradual uh, step by step process over over the years and I think the situation especially for for people that either professionally or personally um, have links with uh, with with people on the other side of the border, or companies, or are helping or working in, in the healthcare sector. For example, um, with this border closure, this you know kind of you know something that was um, acquired and which is one of one of the key uh, cornerstones of the European project, you know, has become uh, very uh, very obvious in how indispensable this has become for our day to day life. And indeed, there are. There are uh, citizens uh, protesting um, uh, on 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 border in border regions uh, today. Um, so I, I I totally agree um, that the measures that have been taken were were necessary to protect uh, to protect the the health um, and the lives of um, of the Europeans. Um, and now the question is, of course, how we kind of go out of this situation in a coordinated way, because you know uh, the. Uh, the virus came um, th 
took us a little bit by surprise, um, uh, but I think very rapidly both uh, member states and the Commission and the European institutions reacted to this. And now we are, you know, we have a roadmap to 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 go back, you know, in a, in a coordinated step by step way. So uh, may, let me just make me three points. Um, first, uh, the state of play today. So today we have uh, we have recommended and uh, virtually all of the Schengen uh, states, member states and Schengen associated countries have implemented restrictions at the external border for non-essential travel. We have recommended this uh, would stay in place until 15th of May. And we will come back to that with a recommendation how to, to go forward. Um, on the internal border side, I think there are 17 member states uh, to date that have notified um, uh, checks because it's not border closures, of course, it's, it is checks and uh, at, the, at the borders. Um, and uh, we, we are in, in constant contact with uh, member states to, to resolve uh, issues that that arise that in inevitably have ar arisen um, because of the kind of you know the uncoordinated um, and, and and very quick way that that these measures have been put in place. The Commission has adopted a number of guidelines to ensure that you know, essential services and goods and and uh, and cross border workers should, should remain uh, be able to cross borders in within 15 minutes. Uh, we have proposed the, these green lanes, uh, which is working relatively well in practice. Um, uh, Commissioner Johansson is in constant contact with, with our counterparts in the member states to resolve issues. We have video conference meetings of, of a member of the of ministers um, at least once a week. So we have done this uh, even twice a week. Uh, so I think we have had more meetings with the ministers of the interior in, uh, in a span of, uh, of a couple of weeks than we had uh, over the course of last year, for example. Um, Commissioner Johansson will also uh, come to the, the European Parliament next week to have a discussion with the Libe uh, Committee on, on where we are. So there's a lot of work going on. Colleagues are working day and night to, to resolve issues and to, you know, to map the, the issues and, and to reach out. So um, second point is the, yeah, how, what, where, where do we go from here? Um, together with the, the European, President of the European Council, um, uh, we have now a joint European roadmap towards lifting of the, of the COVID uh, containment measures. Um, there are essentially, you know, the message there is that we, you know, this will not be like a switch, you know, that we, we flick and the situation goes back to normal. I'm not sure we ever go back to the pre-corona uh, uh, times we go back to a new normal, but I think there are there are three essential criteria that you know will trigger the gradual releasing of restrictions and measures. One, of course, is the the spread of the disease. Um, uh, second is the the capacity of the health uh, systems of the hospitals, uh, the intensive care units, and a third, and that's 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 a that's an important uh, uh, element, of course, is how to monitor how to monitor the, these developments. And this is where we have discussions on, on applications, um, uh, you know, tracking applications and so on. Um, so um, the idea is indeed, um, you know, if you cannot uh, leave your house, you know, I think, you know, we're not gonna talk about the external borders. We have to kind of gradually release the, the measures that restrict, uh, you know, your, the freedom of movement. Um, so the, the external border will be kind of last in line. And on the internal border, you know, once the situation permits, I think uh, we are working towards kind of a strategy that will, you know, uh, enable, um, you know, the releasing of measures, you know, in areas where the health situation uh, kind of converges in, 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 uh, in regions where the social distancing uh, measures actually are applied and are respected and there's a sense of responsibility. And we work together with the uh, European Center for Disease Control to help us map those areas, and that we can kind of, you know, gradually, phase by phase, um, release the, those measures based on, on of course, first and foremost, the, the health situation. Um, so it's a, it will be a step by step. We have not uh, only land borders, of course, we also have air borders and sea borders, and that's part of the, the picture. Part of the, um, you know, of uh, thinking is, of course. You know what is the purpose of travel? We've already said that you know essential uh, uh, cross-border workers, seasonal workers, frontier workers should be able to continue now, um, and we will monitor that and follow up also with the uh, with the respective um, admin national administrations. Um, 
the you know circulation of essential goods and services we know there are, there are guidelines on, on that one and we follow up you know what is the also the social purpose we get a lot of um contacts of of people who are stuck you know who have their partner you know or family on the other side of the border who want to go and see them or visit uh, relatives you know we have the you know the the, the summer is coming uh, so there's a lot of uh, work uh, going on how we can support the tourism uh, sector in in these uh, in these times is a difficult matter but i think uh, it, it's really important especially also for the small businesses uh, in europe that are involved in that so what is the purpose uh, what is the social purpose of travel and to identify categories where you can gradually kind of release you know the the restrictions uh, just the last point um, on on the future scenarios i think uh, yeah um, uh, I would I would uh, advocate uh, really a fifth uh, scenario to to the four that would have been uh, set out, um, and it really builds on the idea that uh, Schengen um, uh, was was not per perfectly functioning before the COVID nineteen crisis. Schengen has been very much a very step step by step a very slow process. I think it took ten years between the signing of the agreement, the Schengen Agreement in 1985 already, and you know, it took ten years before actually the the checks on the borders were, were actually uh, released. Um, gradually, uh, also the size of the Schengen area has has increased. So I would put forward a fifth scenario that it would go, you know, with uh, something like completing. The Schengen area, not back to Schengen, but a forward-looking, uh, completing Schengen, which both on substance, you know, re requires a number of measures that have already been mentioned. Um, one area is migration and asylum, which is really necessary that we go I, to. I will stop on that one because I have a follow-up question. Okay. Uh, so we will go into a second round, but I let Very you good. finish your thought on completely in Schengen, and then I want to move to Katarina. So your last minute, please. Okay. <laughs> So indeed, I, I was just I was just uh, I was just about to finish. Um, what is required to to move forward with Schengen, of course, is an agreement um, with the member states, with the Parliament, on a new pact for migration and asylum, uh, which is uh, which is very uh, close to being uh, uh, finalized. There are a lot of work has gone into that. Um, uh, on the other side is the internal security, where Commissioner Johansson also will come forward with a number of ideas how to reinforce cooperation, which is also necessary uh, to ensure trust between member states and uh, and uh, you know and the you know the absence of, of, of internal border checks, and then of course the strengthening of the external borders uh, where we have Frontex and and so on. So that is in, intricately uh, interlinked. Um, and you know we 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 require further progress on all of those areas in order to kind of move forward with Schengen. And then last but not least, uh, we have already recommended uh, the or also the expansion of the Schengen area, but with the Romania, Bulgaria, and Croatia. So that is also uh, important uh, moving forward. So thanks. Thank you very much, Sean. Very comprehensive. Uh, a new scenario in place, Katerina. How are all these things, measures taken from Brussels, measures taken across Europe, reflected in the Nordic countries, in particular Denmark? Um, is a scenario of smaller Schengens maybe um, less favorable for, for the Danish uh, public? Um, I, I, I throw the ball back to you to reflect on, on what the previous speakers have said. But let's try to keep all our remarks within three minutes so we take some of the questions as we have this half an hour left. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you to Globsec for, for having me and for highlighting this discussion, which um, I think as the virus fades, the border discussion will uh, will spread even more, uh, especially now that the tourist season starts, as Tom also pointed out. Um, I think it, it would be very uh, difficult to give a Nordic perspective on this because uh, my country, Denmark, and, and our closest neighbor, Sweden, are, are probably very different on, on this question. Um, I, I think as the report highlights that there might be a risk that borders are among one of the last barriers from this lockdown to be to be lifted and I think that that's that could definitely be the case uh, here in Denmark where some parties in parliament openly want the border controls to be permanent even. Um, I think listening to the to the discussion, um, I, I just wanted to, maybe to raise uh, three points that were also very much on, on, on my mind. Um, the first is this question that we really need to, to ask ourselves, why are the what are the controls actually about? 
because yes, as, as the previous speakers also said, they are to keep us safe. But I think there are two signs that this is not the full story to this. Um, the first is that uh, when the Danish prime minister went out and made this point as one of the first prime ministers to close the borders, and I think borders also are very contagious. This border closing had a very contagious effect across Europe. But when the Danish prime minister on the 11th of March went out to, to make this point, um, that we need the border controls to keep us safer. She was actually in a very rare occurrence uh, corrected by the head of the Danish health authority who went out to say, this is not our health advice. We, we do not see the health uh, argument for making this move. It's a political move and the prime minister accepted this. So I think that that's one point in a, in a society where I think normally we, we have a fair share of trust in experts. I think that's a fair point. That's, that's one point to keep in mind. And the second, one is that um, th there was also some sign of an amplifier effect. Countries which had a very vocal uh, opinion on migration were among the first to close. And there are definitely countries which have not introduced border controls uh, as a response to the coronavirus. Uh, that goes for Sweden, who's generally taking a, a looser approach, but also for a country like the Netherlands, as far as, as I'm aware. So I think we need to, to also really truly grasp that borders uh, make us feel safer with an emphasis on the feel. And that goes for borders, that goes for control in this uh, world that, that, that we have uh, today. So um, we make our own surveys here, here at the, the Think Tank Europa and uh, half the Danes actually believe that border control, which we've had in Denmark since 2016 in response to the migration crisis, half of the Danes believe that these controls are effective in bringing down illegal migration and crime rates. I haven't seen one statistic proving this. So I think, um, well, for, first of all, that's one call for the Commission to perhaps make more uh, statistics available on, on the effect of border controls. But I also think we, we just need to keep um, this perspective in mind uh, that it's, we saw from Brexit as well, control is such a powerful word today. When, 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 when making efforts to lift border controls, that, that definitely needs to be uh, understood. The, the second point uh, briefly is that, um, and I think I, I very much pick up on what Tom said just before uh, he was stopped, uh, but maybe can elaborate in the second round, is that we, we maybe don't talk so much about going back to Schengen, but about enhancing uh, Schengen. Um, because I think control in some ways is, is here to, to stay. I think people need to feel reassured that there are controls in place and saying back to Schengen will somehow remind of this completely open ideal, very nice for sure in many views, but but um, but but that somehow we will make a, and that ties into the smart border debate that we will we will somehow together in Europe uh, make sure that we we can do this in a controlled and safe way. That might lead to some new steps of of maybe controls where they make more sense. Also, the anti-terrorist uh, point that that you said France uh, is highlighting now. Um, that could be some, maybe not the land border, but other crossings and so on. But but the smart Schengen, I think, is is better than back to Schengen. And finally, um, I think once, of course, all Corona-related controls have been dealt with, if the virus situation allows, I think uh, the discussion is also uh, what is essential for Schengen and what is destroying Schengen. I mean, it's very, I think, to be thankful that Schengen is so resilient and has proven so resilient. I think there's some uh, uh, much good to be said about having some vague rules uh, and ambiguous rules in the in the Schengen code. Um, Schengen has not broken up. It may be on a break, but it, it's it's not broken up. And uh, still, but 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 related to that, um, what the the pre-corona situation. I think from an economic, purely economic perspective, it's fair to say that was not. Um, a, a disruption to the internal market. I know it was probably mainly symbolic and an annoyance to many, but also it, it, uh, it, it, there, were, there were no major signs of queues or, or disrupted uh, supply chains. So I think keeping this discussion about uh, what is uh, essential for Schengen to keep it going and what is actually ruling Schengen also needs to be kept in mind. Thank I'll you so much. Katarina, I think that um, it's very interesting to see uh, various perspectives, uh, depending also on the geographical location and the institutions that uh, we work on. I will try, we started getting some questions, so in my second round, I'll try to incorporate those also in, in the next round. Um, I'm going back to Michal and, and Lucas, uh, because I think it's important to 
um, also look at how EP is a playground also to navigate national priorities when it comes to migration, not just related to the current context, but also longer term. So I would like to hear from your view what's going on in, in Parliament when it comes to national migration priorities. And we had a um, question from, from the audience, from, from Patricia Moradi on, is the, do you envisage a scenario where we would be able to fully respond to such crisis with a full Schengen without borders control in place? So maybe we start again with you, Lucas, and then uh, Michal, the same question will apply to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all the contributions. I have listened closely to them and I agree with a lot and I have learned a lot actually. I uh, just want to uh, underline really my view that uh, it uh, actually saved lives that we closed borders for non-essential travel in Europe. That's my view. Uh, I'm not a medical expert, but I see the results and the numbers. Uh, the numbers show that uh, not closing only the single households and the many factories and uh, nearly all bars and cafes and restaurants in Europe, but also uh, closing the borders where we have them and that's actually the case uh, with the member states uh, meant that uh, less uh, less outbreak uh, was the result um, but of course uh, we need uh, and i agree with the fact that we not only need back to schengen but uh, but a smart schengen uh, i like this idea i like this expression actually um, when it comes to uh, interests uh, or positions of member states uh, and uh, the ones of the European Union, I would really say there is only one uh, relevant interest, that's the one of the citizens of Europe uh, and of course of each and every human being uh, in the world when it comes to migration, uh, but we have uh, the obligation to do our uh, political and parliamentary work on the European level. And that means uh, we have not only to protect uh, our borders uh, against uh, especially illegal migration, but we also have to uh, find also smart hmm, ways to deal with asylum and migration and integration within Europe. Uh, and we see that not each and every member state uh, has uh, the same will uh, to uh, uh, relocate uh, migrants. And not uh, each and every migrant uh, has the will to go in whatever country, uh, but they have uh, very clear uh, impressions on what uh, country they want to go to. And that's why we need uh, solidarity in Europe in dealing with uh, migrants, uh, but uh, some kind of flexibility. Uh, and uh, I would call it an uh, alternative uh, solidarity. That means you can contribute by taking refugees as Austria, uh, has taken uh, very, uh, very uh, many, uh, very much, uh, a very large number of uh, refugees since uh, the migration crisis. Uh, it's uh, on the third place, Austria is on the third place, Eurobyte uh, after Sweden and I guess Malta. Uh, and, uh, but there should be alternative uh, opportunities to contribute to solidarity, like uh, with money, uh, with uh, helping at the external borders uh, for border security. Uh, like uh, education, like uh, development aid, like fighting the uh, causes of uh, people getting uprooted in other parts of the world. So that's that's the view I have on a future uh, migration and asylum system in Europe, uh, which we have to negotiate on. And as already mentioned, the post-Dublin uh, agreement uh, needs the opportunity to relocate migrants in safe third countries. And I've already mentioned the Western Balkans. And um, one question I read already was when will the EU be able to solve such a crisis with fully operational Schengen? Will it ever be there? Frankly, uh, my deep understanding is that uh, a crisis like this uh, needs as one of the uh, mandatory measures to close borders. Uh, and that's, uh, that's also uh, one opportunity within the Schengen system to close borders for a while, temporary, most important word uh, in this first part, I would say today is from Elena, but temporary, it's temporary, but we needed it and such kind of crisis, hopefully the only pandemic in this century, uh, also needs uh, these closed borders. Uh, so I guess that's my, that's my view on this question. We also hope that it's the last pandemic of this century, but we have another 80 years to go, so we never know where we will get. Michal, to you. 
um, especially if, uh, coming from a region that is not the most, um, um, let's call it supportive when it comes to the relocation um, of mm -hmm. um, migrants and to migration in general. Let's keep it short to about two, two minutes intervention so we can take even more questions. We have 20 minutes left. Uh, thanks. I ju just just very quickly to to address the second question that you have, whether this crisis could have been addressed um, in Europe as a whole, uh, actually while retaining um, Schengen operational. I I tend to agree with Lucas that it would be nearly impossible, and that that uh, introducing border checks uh, sort of saved lives and made sense. But especially because um, the crisis responses of member states were are co uncoordinated and often differed from country to country. So. At any given point in time, I mean, you you had open cafes in in uh, say the Netherlands and open bars, but they were already closed in uh, in neighboring Belgium. In which and in, in that particular instance, it obviously made sense to 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 introduce border check because um, you know because then it, it, otherwise it would hamper uh, the, the crisis measures and and their effectiveness uh, those introduced in Belgium because obviously people would go from, from Belgium to, to, to have a beer in, um, in, in the Netherlands. So I think this is part of the problem that we could have retained some, uh, you know, uh, some of the uh, Schengen uh, openness even while dealing with the crisis, but that would have required you know, maximum uh, coordination, coordination and restriction and crisis measures, uh, which obviously did, did, you know, that was not the case. Um, and on, on migration, um, you're right that Slovakia is one of the countries that's been you know the most perhaps in, you know or the least flexible um and the least cooperative in in the past well, seven years or you know how long i've been discussing this i uh especially when it comes to to solidarity and the sort of the thorny issues i don't expect that much change in this position uh, of my of, of of the government in in slovakia despite elections and i actually um and obviously i mean we'll be all looking forward to to the publication of of, of the migration pact by the commission uh my uh suspicion is that there are actually no new ideas in here. Um, I mean, all of those ideas that will be probably in, 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 in the pact and in some way or another were already discussed. I mean, from reinforcing external borders to obviously an effective returns policy to solidarity, which is more flexible. All these things are, are somewhere in the debate already. The question is whether we find a compromise uh, now that we've that been you know, so elusive for the past couple of years. Um, and you know what will the balance uh, and the elements of that compromise be? My sense is that it's going to become more difficult because of the coronavirus, because you know nationalist, uh, isolationist tendencies will and extremist uh, currents will will be will be strengthened by this. Yes, you would see people uh, calling for you know borders to be permanent, calling for um, you know fortress Europe. Uh, I think the Corona experience and the trauma of the lockdowns and everything and the fear will, will strengthen those uh, those voices. And there will be people who will be saying that, uh, you know, that uh, the whole spread of the Corona epidemic is due to Schengen, which of course cannot be more wrong. You know, just look at the United Kingdom. But, uh, but I think this is going to be an argument uh, that's going to be used in debate and it will also poison the debate on reforming Dublin and, and migration packs and all that. That's kind of my... Uh, my worry. For sure, uh, migration and Schengen are instrumentalized and will continue to be instrumentalized for various political gains, uh, in particular by, by some political actors. Um, Tom, your, the question for you is related to the new um, uh, EU pact for migration and, and asylum, uh, when, when to expect. But before uh, getting to you, I want to ask Alena and, and Katrina um, about the smart Schengen. And in your view, uh, based on the research and, and uh, the reports that you, you produced, what would be those measures now that we are preparing to, to um, lift the restrictions um, that will contribute to minimizing the risk of um, further spread of the crisis, the crisis continuing, and uh, will allow for a nor normalization to a new Schengen, let's put it that way. So what would be those measures that you would recommend as experts, um, both to the commission and the national governments? Elena, you wanna go first? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Alex and everybody. Uh, 
I agree absolutely with the defining where we're going to end up post-crisis as a smart champion, because indeed, as in many other areas, there is no point in going back to an inferior version that we have before, and we can use it as an opportunity to create a better version or an upgrade. The question is, and that goes along with what Michal was just saying, whether we're in the current environment able to find political compromises and the political will to create this upgraded version. From the technical point of view, what kind of measures uh, can be there. Um, definitely Tom started talking about it uh, and Michal alluded to the question that the, in a way, all these measures and suggestions were uh, made multiple times. Like for example, if we are talking about enhanced cooperation and security matters, we do know that we need to build trust and find better ways to coordinate the intelligence services and the information sharing within the European Union, be it through uh, creating a shared uh, databases or better passing giving access to the national information to authorities in other countries. So the question, uh, the these technical measures that are very well outlined uh, uh, and are there. The question now is how to move forward on implementing them in practice. And I also agree with everybody who made the comment before that it's very likely that finding these compromises and implementing these measures will take many years to come. From my perspective, uh, it's actually these technical measures that are most valuable in the current situation because they do not attract so much public attention and political discussions. It's much easier to talk uh, and find a solution on the technical measure, let's say how to share databases between the various actors because the general public doesn't pay that much attention and it's not politicized. Then looking for a big symbolic compromises on the migration that uh, attract a lot of attention and can be abused for uh, domestic political purposes. I also wanted to make one more comment and that's connected to the discussion about um, uh, whether uh, we go for uh, economic efficiency and functioning of the single markets. And there were uh, highlighted many times already in the discussion that it's very important that the uh, single market from the point of view of the free movement of goods was not, uh, uh, we did everything we could to facilitate the smooth functioning of this uh, part. And then moving forward, there will be a discussion what is essential for, this in, uh, for the Schengen zone and what's not essential. But I would be very careful in defining what's not essential and trying to eliminate the symbolic aspect from the discussion. Because Michal was talking about how important it is for Central Europe symbolically to keep the open borders. And the symbolic element cannot always be just taken out of the discussion. And also, there are also practical linkages between symbolic and economic aspects. For example, uh, we already had the discussion, let's say, in many uh, Western countries and that was definitely a discussion even in the UK before Brexit, whether the workers from Central Europe or Southern Europe should be allowed in. And uh, that was a very politicized and emotional and symbolic de uh, debate. What we're seeing now, especially let's say in France and Germany, is there is suddenly a discussion who is going to be harvesting asparagus in all these countries because all the workers are not coming. And uh, suddenly uh, France and Germany would love the posted workers because in the end, uh, everybody who was criticizing the policy, nobody wants to take the places of these workers. So I would advocate also for not entirely, yes, in going forward with trying to implement the small technical measures that would lead to a, a big upgrade in the future, but also not forgetting the symbolic elements that are very important for the public discourse. Thanks a lot, Alena. I think this small wins approach could uh, save the day in, in the current very intense uh, context. And um, indeed, symbolics and um, economic uh, measures do go hand in hand, um, and they are diverse or they, they are distinct from region to region. And that's something that I'm not really entirely sure that in Brussels, this, this message is uh, well captured. Uh, Katrina, what smart measures uh, would you recommend um, moving forward to create that new or upgraded Schengen? Well, I think in, in terms of, uh, of, of, of how Schengen can respond with this, uh, both the virus threat, the invisible threat and the visible, uh, not threat, but the visible occurrence of, of migration and free movement. Well, I think with, with, the, with the virus, I think it, it has been social distancing that really has worked. It doesn't matter if you are from another country, if you keep two meters away from each other, the risk of spreading the virus will become less. And I think what some countries have also done is to introduce internal borders, uh, regions, uh, where it made sense. And I think that that's maybe a, a point to take away uh, in the future of Schengen discussions, because 
um, in, in my view, the, the, the key question should be where, where does accepting that control in some way has come to stay, maybe more than we've had in the past, where does this control make more sense? Is it necessarily at a land border or could it be at key infrastructure points? If it's health tests and fever control, is it at, at airports, is it supermarkets, uh, uh, big shopping centers? Wh where does it make sense to have control provided that control is here to stay and to have a joint EU discussion on that? And on, on, um, on, on the smart borders issue, I mean, some of these um, uh, initiatives that are mainly today discussed uh, on the external Schengen border uh, could maybe with EU help be, be discussed at internal borders or at key infrastructure points. That, that's, you know, number plate scanners, um, a lot of um, initiatives um, to, to quickly and smoothly ensure control, but without having to get people uh, necessarily out of their cars. But those are extremely expensive measures. And perhaps now that we are talking about um, using EU funds to, to both uh, to, to jointly exit from the crisis, um, maybe that could be focused on, on allocate on jointly helping member states uh, develop more smart border, maybe not border, but smart infrastructure in terms of uh, making sure Schengen can, can, can work. Thank you, Katarina. Tom, the question for you, when should we expect the new EU migration and asylum pact? And to connect with that, maybe you could also give us um, a glimpse of light on how the EU is maintaining a sufficient level of support for external border states receiving migrants. Um, so the external borders of, of the EU in the current context where the burden sharing has uh, been quite a contentious issue for, for some time. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I know I, I, I talked a bit too much in the beginning, so I'll be very, very brief now. Um, I, I agree very much with uh, what Kat Katerina said um, um, on, on borders, actually. Um, I think uh, we are dealing with, um, with a virus that uh, does not know borders, but it does know uh, social distancing. Um, so I think, you know, that should be the, the start of the reflection um, uh, in, in terms of, you know, relaxing uh, measures. On um, what Schengen, the, the, there's what, there are two questions I saw there. There's a, a, a um, fully functioning Schengen. Is this necessary to, um, to deal with a crisis like these? Absolutely. I think, uh, I think uh, solidarity, cross-border solidarity is absolutely indispensable. And we have seen many good examples of, for example, Romanian uh, healthcare workers going to help in hospitals in, in Italy, for example. Uh, we have, there, there are numerous uh, um, um, examples of, of where member states have helped each other, both in, in, in terms of personnel, but also in equipment. Um, there are also numerous examples on, on the migration and asylum side. Um, uh, even in these times of, of Corona crisis, where there are restrictions at borders and non-essential uh, movement is, is limited, um, you know, there are a few member states, uh, um, uh, notably Luxembourg and Germany, that have welcomed unaccompanied minors that were stuck on uh, Greek islands, and so that did, I think uh, that is uh, very encouraging. There are a number of member states that are very uh, soon will will follow suit. There is Switzerland. Uh, there is Portugal, there is Slovenia, and there are, I think, uh, generally ten more member states that uh, agreed in principle to uh, receive 1,600 uh, children who are alone in uh, and, and teenagers who are alone in, in, in Greece, uh, even in these times of of, uh, of crisis and of you know restrictions. This is possible. Um, so the word on, on the pacts, um, will it be more difficult now? I think uh, this was <clears throat> you know. Uh, it took a, a number of years uh, to uh, to discussions that uh, that then didn't uh, materialize under the, the previous commission. Now we have a new commission. Uh, we have a strong support of the commission president to move forward with a new pact. I think the signs are actually quite favorable. I think on both on the side of the member states, um, the ministers seem to be uh, also uh, eagerly anticipating um, to start discussing and negotiating an, a new pact to get uh, um, uh, out of this blocked situation. Also on the on the parliament side, I think uh, we have seen many encouraging uh, signals. So I think uh, we are we are we're very close. Uh, Commissioner Johansson has had uh, 
has met all member states uh, bilaterally um, uh, in person in, in, in the capitals in the beginning of the mandate and, and followed up uh, um, you know, almost every day. So I think uh, um, the question on when this, this pact will, will come, I think you know, now with the, with the corona uh, measures, I think we are all working very much on the recovery package that touches upon the economic side, uh, uh, also on the, on the MFF side. And so as soon as, uh, as, as, soon as uh, we have dealt with those, the most pressing issues, I think we will be ready to, to come forward. Um, we don't have a date yet, um, but, um, but I think uh, it is important to, to move on quickly, as, as the commissioner also said uh, after the, the last uh, council meeting. Uh, so I'm relatively optimistic, actually, that we can, we can get out of this. Um, and then just one last point. Um, um, I think the paper also mentions the role that migrants play uh, in these corona times in different sectors, in essential sectors, in the healthcare sector. Uh, you, you've mentioned also the work in the, in the agricultural sector. We need both intra and extra uh, EU migrants to, to help. They play a significant role and uh, that only works, of course, when we have you know, uh, an, an open uh, Schengen system and a good uh, functioning migration system. And that is one of the key elements of a, of a new pact, which will be comprehensive and we will contain uh, new elements. Uh, so uh, stay tuned for that. I'm, I'm happy to hear that optimism. We are approaching the end of it. I will give each one of you one minute for wrap up remarks, but I do want to take stock of a few important um, conclusions that um, I feel uh, obliged as moderator to share. So uh, Schengen is here to stay, um, but we need a smart Schengen, an upgraded version um, that will uh, fit the, the, the new uh, needs and uh, long-term resilience objectives. Closing, a bo closing the borders uh, was a sign of solidarity, not of lack of solidarity, and it was needed to, to uh, control the disease. Um, and then the EU migration pact is somewhere on the pipeline with an optimistic view that might come uh, sooner rather than later. However, with the current economic um, uh, rescue packages and discussions, uh, we'll have to see how um, that work will come together and might also be politicized uh, by various uh, parts of Europe. With that in mind, I will start with, uh, again with, with Lucas and, and Michal uh, for your final one minute remarks. And if you could also maybe touch upon MFF negotiations and how um, borders, if borders play a role into the um, into these negotiations. Lucas? Thank you. Uh, I tried to be brief uh, since I also have to leave for a different appointment at uh, 11. Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we remain within the time schedule. I just want to share my view that uh, all, I would say all reasonable groups in European Parliament, which is the vast majority, and all uh, reasonable uh, officials of governments of uh, the European Union member states uh, are uh, on, the, uh, on the same line when it comes to the question of solidarity. What we talk about is not if we need solidarity, uh, solidarity but how we do it. And uh, that's true for within Europe, uh, solidarity within the European Union, as well as for solidarity with migrants and people who get uprooted and so on. Uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, keep in touch and let's uh, negotiate even uh, post uh, Dublin agreement and everything else that had been mentioned today. Uh, but uh, let's always uh, remember that we all want solidarity and want to uh, act within the framework of the European values. Thank you, Lucas. Michal? Yeah, thanks very much. I'm 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 glad that the uh, the debate has sort of taken an optimistic turn, uh, and uh, and it's really glad to hear. And, and I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, the Commission's work on well restoring um, um, the Schengen Schengen free zone, and then proposing um, um, a migration and asylum pact that could be accepted uh, by all member states, and of course uh, then presenting you know um, smart Schengen or improvements to. Uh, to the Schengen area, also taking stock of, of you know, our response to the epidemic, and that's and, and it all sounds great, and and I would you know be be you know the one also in the European Parliament and my political group that would support the Commission in this and and try to uh, work with with the EPP and with other groups. My I, I just have a sort of a lingering um, kind of a worry or um, or anxiety that that politics will will interfere, um, national politics specifically. 
uh, in, in some member states and given also the economic crisis and, and you know, the, the trauma that we've just all been through with lockdowns, I can't see this not um, impacting on, on, on these debates, uh, frankly. Uh, and then there's one final thing which I, which I wanted to mention, which has been sort of mentioned in passing, but that's all of these, um, all of these uh, measures and all of these reforms, be it to you know, the Schengen itself or to the migration and asylum, uh, require you know, a huge amount of trust between member states. Um, and, and, and that trust is not just about you know, how you handle things on the other side of the border, how well you check uh, you know, travelers or, or, or migrants or whoever, it's also uh, you know, something, more, something more fundamental. And uh, it has to do also with, with rule of law, with democracy, with all of these issues that are at the heart um, you know, of, of, of the EU. And, and this I think is a sort of a more underlying problem is that um, as we see some governments uh, sort of departing from what we would consider, you know, the European um, constitutional order, I think that will also impact on the trust that we have among each other, uh, because, you know, the trust comes from the fact that we're all liberal, liberal democracies following the rule of law. Um, so, um, and, and as, you know, I, and, I, and I see this as a potentially big problem, especially when it comes to the rule of law, because that, that directly affects, you know, uh, the, the EU as a legal community and also Schengen. Uh, so I think that's another factor to 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 you know to keep in mind uh, in these debates. But uh, I'm happy for the optimism that's um, that's in this panel. Thank you, Michal. Tom, your last uh, remarks, final remarks. Yeah, just to to thank you all for for this uh, for the for organizing this for the paper. Uh, I think keep up uh, that work. It is really indispensable and will feed into the work that we're doing. Um, yes, I am an optimist. Um, I think we do uh, need to indeed, as alluded to, build on our fundamental rights and values that, uh, that, um, that unites us in, in Europe. Trust is something that um, takes a lot of time. You know, it comes uh, by foot, it leaves by horseback, but um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work. And, you know, we're 35 years into Schengen and it will, it will you know, need a little bit more additional work, but uh, you can trust on us to come forward with good proposals. And then we, uh, we uh, as always, we find uh, political solutions to political problems in, in a spirit of compromise with the, with the parliament uh, uh, first and foremost, and, and of course with the, with the member states, so. Thank you, Tom. Katarina? Um, well, uh, it's a final point maybe to, to pick up uh, knowing the allure of, of borders and of control um, to, to, to think more about how, how we reduce the domestic pressure for, for having the, the internal border controls and sustaining them, both vis-a-vis -vis migrants, uh, free movement and, and uh, crime and terrorism. I think what would really help us as a think tank uh, doing and work on this would be to have more uh, simple cost benefit analysis of, of what is the price of keeping things as they are, um, as they were, as, as introducing a, a smart Schengen. Uh, I don't think member states individually are the best placed or, or are going to do these kind of cost uh, benefit analysis, but I think they would, they would really help in knowing wh where would be the most smart places to, to, to introduce more control and to where, where are criminals caught? It could be uh, how, uh, crime statistics, but maybe a coordinated attempt to do a Schengen-related uh, cost-benefit analysis as a suggestion to, to Tom and, and the Commission. I think that would help think tanks work a lot. Thank you, Katarina. Elena, your final remarks? I will definitely join the ranks of optimists who are aware of all the compli cal complicated situation uh, around us, uh, but who are ready to work to make this optimistic scenario happen. And following the other suggestions of what else we need to discuss to move the agenda forward, one aspect that we didn't have time to discuss today, but I suggest another discussion on this matter, uh, we do need to talk also about the global perspective. We focused on the internal EU issues, but uh, even if we work very hard, it is very unlikely that the EU by itself is going to solve even the issue of the internal functioning of the Schengen zone. We do need to work uh, with the global partners on deciding how we're gonna um, help people to have economic uh, uh, options at home, how we're going to manage migration flows, how we control the threat of terrorism globally, and of course, of course directly relating for the EU, how we regulate and how we create opportunities for legal uh, movements in Europe for people who, do not, who were not fortunate enough to be born in Europe. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for, for this insightful conversation. Uh, this is the start of it um, as uh, we um, 
uh, embark on a longer yeah, effort uh, from the GLOBSEC side to, to help uh, the Commission, Parliament, uh, member states with uh, research and analysis uh, pertaining to, to borders, to Schengen, and how do we ensure that uh, the four fundamental freedoms um, that the, the Union is uh, built upon will continue to exist with or without uh, global crisis and pandemics. I don't have a, um, yeah, usually there will be a, a round of applause from, from everyone, but in this current context, I think that we'll, we'll leave it with a thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to the audience and looking forward to continuing engaging in the future. Goodbye. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.